everyone. This is Omar Khan. I'm the founder of Boardwalk Wealth, and this is our 2023 GNN State of the Union. The theme for this update could be risk management versus return enhancement. That's a little bit of a teaser for you. But we're joined by our chief of staff and head of investor relations, Eric Wong. Eric, why don't you let everyone know what they're in for? Everyone, Eric Wong here. So we have a lot of important information to cover. And what's the goal? It's to empower you to make great and excellent financial decisions for 2024 so that you prosper. So here's an overview of the topics that we have at hand today. First topic, we're going to cover macroeconomic trends as well as some top multifamily news stories. Next, we'll do an overview of our entire portfolio, both acquisitions and developments. We'll then transition into an examination of potential upcoming offers and what we are targeting for you in 2024. Finally, we'll close out our thoughts for the year and we'll define what opportunistic means. So before we get into it, Omar, please remind our listeners, our investors, the people, why they'll profit from listening to you. Well, I'm a CFA charter holder. That's a gold standard in portfolio and risk management. My track record and our team's track record is $580 million plus in commercial real estate transactions and $3.7 billion in equity and capital financing M&A transactions. We structured the firm intentionally as an operator first firm. We're not just a capital raiser, which means we have intimate control over every facet of every deal that we're in. And we have no multifamily capital calls, no capital calls, period. No foreclosures ever. We just did another successful exit. We're going to talk more about that. Open up three developments in this year alone. We've got a handful of projects in the pipeline for 2024. And we continue, as always, to bid opportunistically on value right deals. Plus, if it matters to some people, I'm told I've got a great set of hair. So hopefully the camera gets my good side. Okay. So the first topic is macroeconomic trends. So Omar, let's talk about the, the Treasury, the Fed, and give us your succinct summary of the key points and where you think we're heading. So the 10-year Treasury rate, I'm saying it or take two months ago, was all the way up to 5%. Now, you have to remember, this is coming from close to 0% about 24 months ago. So this is a historic spike up. So it was close to about 5%, and then it dropped like a rock to about 3.9%, give or take. So lots of volatility there, right? It dropped about 20%. The Fed, though, has continued its pausing regime. It's guided towards three rate cuts in 2024. The market's expecting a lot more than that. Now, these rate cuts and the pausing of this regime, um, offering, you know, pausing and then potentially cutting rates in 2024, this is good if you're refinancing. So if you're an investor, you've got a couple of projects you're invested in that possibly looking to refinance. This is very good because rates come down. The ability to refinance is increased. And, you know, if you're looking at a few deals, rates coming down is obviously better. You get a cheaper rate, blah, 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 you know, all of that stuff. But the counterpoint to all this giddiness that people have about rates coming down is that typically when the fight cuts rates, it's a harbinger of an upcoming recession or rather the fear of a recession. And the Fed has this weird role or it's in a weird position right now where it's putting its foot on the brake paddle because it wants to reduce speculative activity. It wants to reduce the frothiness in the market. But concurrently, it's also putting its other foot on the accelerator because it doesn't want to reduce it too much because you don't want to go into a recession. So kind of this weird interplay is going on. It's a weird example, but you understand where I'm going with this. But the fact of the matter is in hot markets, we're talking the Phoenixes, Tampas, Austins. I mean, especially Phoenix and Austin. Vacancy is up and rent growth is strong. Okay, so long story short, there's some good news, some bad news. We're going to keep chugging along. But that is a good segue, and we should talk about some major multifamily markets. Um, I'm going to review. Let, let's look at some of the headlines over the past uh, quarter. Right, So there's Texas multifamily is in trouble, uh, but Midwest is stable. And then finally, a big one that we hear in multiple news sources is capital calls across the country. Please, Omar, let's give some light into that. Let's start with the capital calls part, right? My opinion is a few basis points in reduction in the rates. This is not going to save bad deals, and this is especially not going to save bad deals with bad management. 
And we keep hearing there have been more and more capital calls in 2023, and they're expected to come out even more in 2024. Now, you have to understand, this is not just the fault of the multifamily market or the markets. It's more about sloppy sponsors and the people who've enabled them. Capital calls, though, can sometimes be a necessary evil. But in my opinion, if a sponsor has a capital call, they should provide a clear, easy to understand roadmap on how these potential funds will be judiciously used so that past mistakes are not made again. Another reason that I believe is contributing to these capital calls is the skyrocketing rates, uh, prices of rate caps. Now, I'll give you an example. In 2019, when we closed on Equinox at night, I bought a three-year rate cap, I, I think somewhere like $25,000, $35,000, something like that. In 2022, I sold that rate cap, excuse me, for a little over $900,000, $900,000. And by the way, we juiced half of that rate cap by that time, right? Uh, about $900,000, we bought another three-year rate cap for about $700,000. And now when we sold the Equinox at night, in uh, you know we sold this in December, we still got four hundred and forty eight thousand dollars from this rate cap. So if you think about how volatile this rate cap thing has been, and this used to be a rounding error, this used to be a, a an item nobody paid any attention to. It was a hedging instrument. It's an insurance product. It's not supposed to be that punitive and expensive. But if you're on the wrong end of this volatility, as you can see, all your liquidity can be sucked up. And this is why a lot of folks that didn't ladder their portfolio or ladder their exposure correctly. Now, what does laddering mean? It means that let's say we've got 10 rate caps. Now, you don't want all of them to be expiring in the same month, right? You want one to be expiring in quarter one, one to be expiring in quarter two, and so on and so forth. Folks that didn't ladder their exposure, all of their liquidity has been sucked dry. There is nothing there. So now you have lots of sponsors that potentially buy deals in good markets, good locations, good fundamentals. They've straight up run out of liquidity and they are in trouble. And this is why I've been always harping about liquidity to internally as well as to our partners. My family's invested over multiple generations like a lot of my mentors have. And the only thing that has saved people us and other multiple other people, it's not necessarily intelligence. It's the fact that you diligently sock away huge sums of liquidity during good times, because as the good book says, you'll have seven years of feast and seven years of famine. And it is important to shore up this liquidity during the good times because you don't know when the bad time comes. Now, let's specifically talk about Texas and Florida in particular, because these seem to be darling markets, but they are the classic boom and bust cycle markets. Look, I live in Dallas. I love Texas. It's a great place to live. I started off in Texas. I cut my teeth in Texas. I've got two assets left in Florida. These are classic boom and bust markets. When you're doing good and it's booming, you think you're walking on water because everything you touch turns to gold. But when things go bad, you can't catch a break. Specifically in Texas, we haven't even looked at any transactions. Why? Because you, apart from just skyrocketing interest rate costs, there's a lot of distress happening now and has been happening because of spiraling repairs and maintenance costs. Insurance is crazy. It's even nuts in Florida, as a lot of Florida sponsors and investors can tell you. And taxes are so punitive in Texas and getting reassessed at such wildly variable rates that it's just very hard to plan for the future. So, it's just very hard to be in markets that are classic boom and bust cycles. Now, does that mean we don't look at value right deals? I mean, yeah, we look at them, but I'm not going to overpay somebody or pay anyone what they feel like their darling asset is worth just because I can't plan for the future. This is why, you know, I refer to that saying Wayne Gretzky has, right? You've got to skate to where the puck is going. We let the data guide us. And we moved aggressively into Sioux Falls, which I believe is a darling market in the Midwest from 2021 onward. And as you can see from this chart now on the screen, the unemployment there is across the business cycle. You see all the way from 1990 to present day time, whereas Texas, Georgia, Florida, they, and the national average, they have these big spikes during bad times and then unemployment goes down, got another big spike. Not a lot of that stuff happens in the Midwest, especially Sioux Falls and South Dakota. Steady at the unemployment. The bad times for them are like 
of 5% unemployment, and this is during the worst recession of all time, right? And then if you look at the median incomes, you see compared to the darling markets we have of Texas, Georgia, Florida, the median incomes here are all much higher. So what do you have? You have stability of income and you have higher incomes to begin with. So by the way, all of this data is publicly available from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Anyone can go and download this data and you can compare your own data sets to ours just to make sure that you know, you've got the right data that you're looking at. So compared to the other states that we're talking about where rent growth has been non-existent, Midwest has still has steady ID rent growth, which you've got to remember, these aren't markets which shoot up like 100% one year, down 50, up 100, none of that stuff matters. The Midwest doesn't boom, but it doesn't bust. It's steady ID, consistent, safe, conservative growth all the time. And this is why it's always important to go deep with the sponsor. You know, you're betting on the jockey, not the horse. You have to understand what are they thinking? What are their research and signals pointing to? In our case, we believe our research and signals based on our experiences are slightly ahead of the market. And this is why we've been able to go into these markets much before other people have been going in. Okay, so there was a lot to unpack there. I will revisit some of those points there. I'm going to go off of my questions, but I'll revisit them later. And those two things are doing the right things consistently having strong operations and just being steady Eddie, like you said. And then the other one is having the foresight to not just follow the trends because when you're following trends, then you're going to be behind. So I'll get back to those later. I hope I don't forget, but let's I have a question for you. So were you surprised by any of the news or the trends by the end of the year or the last quarter? I shouldn't be surprised. Stephen, after all these years, I still am. <laughs> Excuse me. During boom times, look, all I would hear about is how every single investor, every single sponsor was a dyed in the wool value investor. Tons of Warren Buffett quotes, real and fake, by the way, were, you know, I would hear them every day. And then as soon as the market started becoming choppy, we quickly saw a flight of investor capital from the industry. Look, if anything, recessions are the best time to buy. You're getting deals at cents on the dollar. But it seems a mantra of buy low and sell high always gets turned on its head during bad times. And suddenly people aren't uh, died in the bull value investors to say they are. But coming back to our main theme of risk management, I can say surprised, but I shouldn't say unprepared. The way we shored up our cash reserves, the way we built and leased up these developments that we have, the way we have managed our rate cap exposure, the way we negotiated with lenders in 2023, we made sure we were prepared for surprises. And I'll be a little brief because now you see this chart on the screen or rather this graphic on the screen. I want to point about this thing, how recovering from losses is catastrophic in investing. So many investors, we keep talking to people, keep talking about just making returns. I want to show you these charts because I want to illustrate to you that as an astute investor, just making returns is shouldn't even be on your priority list. You have to be managing your risk exposure all the time. So look at this first chart over here, right? Or graphic over here, whatever is the right word. The red line, the red graph rather, the bar graph shows you that if you have, say, in this case, say a 50% uh, decline in um, value. So this is the third bar graph or third red bar graph from the right. If you have a 50% decline in value of your principal investment, you need a 100% return just to break even. Think about it this way. You've got 100 grand. God forbid you lost 50% of it, right? $50,000. Now you need to make 100%, which is double your money before you're back to your principal of $100,000. And coming to the second infographic over here, smaller losses, I mean, it goes without saying, are easier to recover from because big drops means you have to have exponential returns just to break even. So if you see the initial loss, if you have an 8% initial loss, you've got 100 grand, turns into $92,000, you only need 8.7% to break even, back to, back to zero. But if you're at this, you lost 50% of money, you need 100% return. And as you can see from this, this graphic, how quickly this entire thing escalates, basically. The point is that losses must be viewed as unacceptable. Now look, not meeting return expectations, not hitting those targets, that's regrettable, but it happens. But losses are just so much more harder to recover from and should be as much as possible avoided. Now, this sometimes can result in certain annoying actions like pausing distributions. 
that can protect you from future catastrophic events. We've done this on select investments. And this is what a good sponsor does. They decide when to make somewhat of an annoying decision, but so that they can steward your capital through rough and choppy waters. And I can tell you, I've had these conversations with my partners where I foresaw what was happening. We have to pause distributions to shore up our balance sheet. A lot of people told me, hey, what will these people think? What will investors say? We're going to get a lot of flag. But we took that decision proactively. And because we took those decisions proactively, we are now in a position where our balance sheet is shored up by the grace of God. So just remember this. You know, return enhancement is not as important as risk management. As a mentor of mine once said, if you take care of the downside, the upside takes care of itself. That's a very good point, Omar. Let, let's move on to the next section because we, we should probably talk about portfolio overview. In the next section, we'll do a portfolio overview. Omar, you asked, or actually we asked our excellent asset manager, Miles, to prepare some charts and some graphs for us to tell investors how our portfolio is doing. So I'll give the floor to you. Please just review some of these numbers at a high level and then go into some details. Thank you, Eric. And by the way, thank you, Miles, for doing a stellar job. So as you can see on this first graphic uh, about the rents, what you're seeing is that the market rents were going up and down. But they, as we mentioned earlier, these markets, rents, organic market rents are going down. As you can see, the market rents are going down, but our average rent has consistently been going up just in the last little bit. It's dipped down a little bit from about... Thirteen twenty-five to just about thirteen hundred dollars. Now we were in a loss to lease scenario. We're in a gain to lease scenario right now. But the point that I want to emphasize is the consistency with which our team has been performing. So even in a scenario when market rates across the year have gone down, net net our average rent in, has increased. We are able to capture all of that stuff. And on the occupancy side, as you can see, the occupancy uh, was always you know it's moving it's always in a portfolio of this size it's always moving up and down but it's in the mid to high 90s and the pre-lease obviously tracks that very closely and the reason for this is because you always want to make sure that you know as you have certain people leaving your property you're filling these things out all the time right so you always that pre-lease and physical occupancy they kind of have to go hand in hand a little bit of volatility but again the point is that we keep hearing people lamenting that occupancy is going down, rents are going down, and it's all doom and gloom. And the fact here is that even in some more tough, choppy waters, as long as you consistently perform, you're going to be doing fine. So on their own, these charts are solid. The performance is fine. But in context of what the market is doing, I'm very pleased with the results. Our investors are as well. We've emailed about this, posted to social media, so I won't belabor the point. This is not down to luck. This is not down to just picking good markets or demand outpacing supply or some pithy comment somebody gives. This is a very specific occupancy first process that I've been directing our team on. And once a property is stabilized, we stay in the mid to high 90s. That's our primary objective and target. The team works very, very, very hard towards it. Now, here's an infographic we made for you. This is a cost associated with a turnover. High level on average across our portfolio, we are looking at these expenses. Um, you know, when we lose a resident, people leave all the time, right? We do our best to have an occupancy first month, right? But people leave, life happens, stuff happens, right? So it costs about $100,000 to $2,000 to repair a unit, uh, just, you know, touch up paints, all of that sort of stuff. $600 potentially about a loss of revenue for just two weeks of vacancy. Now, this doesn't mean it takes us just two weeks to. Uh, turnover unit. It also makes, you know, somebody can lease it the first day, they just move in two weeks later. So then that's when we start getting the revenue, but we still lost two weeks worth of rent, right? 200 advertising referral fees. You've got to do it. You've got to advertise your units. $50 credit check fee. Now imagine that we have a great resident, which we have lots of great residents. They're a quality resident. They pay their bills on time. They don't cause a nuisance. They're a great person to have around. You don't want to lose that resident ever. In fact, in any business, you don't want to lose that customer that's quality customer. So we can offer a resident, say, a 50 to $75 rent reduction, keep the resident, and it will still be beneficial to us because instead of spending $2,000 or $3,000 in change, we can just spend 50 to 75, which is what, 50 times 12 is 675, times 12 is 900, saving between six to $900 we can spend over the course of the year, keep a quality resident, and net-net from a cash flow perspective, we're still coming out ahead. 
Okay, that is a very important point right there. It's just to hone in on the fact that you don't want to be moving people in and out. Like, you have to be adaptable. So unit repairs, uh, rental costs, right? It's a normal thing to do renovations. It's a whole value add, right? But why don't you tell our listeners the difference between value creation in a rent growth market versus in a down market where we're doing some of these adaptions? So look, this is a great distinction. I don't think a lot of people even know about this distinction. So Eric, you've been trained well. Who trained you? Seriously. You did. You did, Omar. You're the best. You're the best ever. There is a trade-off between rent growth vis-a-vis ROI from renovations, right? But remember, our key strategy in value creation is not just some abstract growth. It's expense reduction, maximum occupancy. In other words, we're, we want to push total collections, total revenue, total cash that we collect. We want to manage our expenses, push up net operating income as high as possible. It's not on a per unit level only. We want to do it across the entire asset and then do it across the entire portfolio. So the simple ROI equation basically becomes, you know, potential increases in rents per month because of renovations per month multiplied by 12 gets you the annual number divided by the CapEx cost, turnover costs, and or the admin and marketing expenses gives you a quick and dirty ROI number. Now, once rents have reached a peak in the market, which they, by the way, have, in most of the Southeast market, I don't care what sponsors tell you. This is reality backed by data. Phoenix, it's a bloodbath right now. Dallas, it is a bloodbath right now. Austin, Tampa, it is brutal out there. You can't raise rates. Market rents are declining. So much supply is hitting the market. So once there is a peak in rents for a little while, the emphasis shifts to cash conservation due to non-existent ROI. You don't have an ROI. You can renovate as many units as you like. You're just not going to get that rent premium because the person can go literally across the street and rent a unit for $100, $200, $300 less. Why would they pay you more money just because you have a gold toilet, right? <laughs> or you've got a sexy backsplash? Nobody gives a shit, right? So don't get me wrong. We have to turn over a percentage of our units. People move. You know, somebody punches a hole in the wall. That happens, by the way, right? You got you to do these things. But right now, this is not the market for the hottest new backsplash in order to command market rents. And our occupancy being in the mid to high 90s is proof positive that you don't have to keep dumping money into renovations. You have to take selective strategic measures in order to maximize net operating income. Yeah, and this speaks to these unsophisticated sponsors who tell investors, oh, you can just go in there, you, you paint a new wall, and then you add a... A new like countertop, and then you can just jack up the, the rents, right? It just in this market, it's not you can't do that. You have to be sophisticated, you have to do the right things that aren't necessarily sexy. It's a day in, day out, steady eddy. Yeah. And I'm just like, sorry to interrupt. I just like to add there. Look, it's not like this is a bad strategy about putting renovations value at. It's not a bad strategy, it's a great strategy. We cut our teeth on this, but there's a time and place for every strategy. It, no strategy is a one size fits all, one strategy for all seasons. Right now, it is this. Let's assume uh, next year or a couple of months from now, two years from now, there is a big demand surge, but not enough supply, which, by the way, is expected to happen because the rates are so high. Not a lot of product is being built. Then you go back to this strategy. What you have to understand is that the market is very dynamic. The market will keep moving. And just having just being a one-trick pony doesn't cut it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We have to be dynamic, and that's how we've been successful. All right, so let's let's move on to the next question here. Um, portfolio milestones in late 2023, particularly for multifamily developments. Please give a review. So everybody knows about the launch of the Blue on Lorraine. We discussed this at the last uh, State of the Union as well. Uh, we are uh, we're slightly about 70% pre-leased in four months. That's at record pace. And by the way, this is during the low time of the year, low season, low, low not busy season, whatever is the right word. So we're building towards stability of occupancy, which means 90% occupancy for 90 days heading into Q1 of 2024. The other development milestone is that we delivered the first building of the Wealth House. Uh, wealth House or Wealth House? What is it, Eric? Wealth House or Wealth I, I don't know, man. It, like, I thought it was Belt House, and then sometimes people are saying Belt House. It's not Belt, it's not belt House, though. That's it's wrong. not Belt House also, just to let me know. No, that's definitely wrong. Yeah. Come on. We're way better than that. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's Valtas. The first building's been uh, delivered right on time, by the way. We said first rent collections are going to happen in December. Happen in December. 30% pre-lease. Now, this demonstrates the demand for the type of product we're building. Because think about it this way. People 
are wanting to rent in a glorified construction site just because of the quality of the product we're delivering and the price that we're delivering on. We broke on ground on two sites, Briarwood Reserve and Jefferson Reserve. On our flagship no-fills development, Briarwood Reserve, we closed land in the last, uh, I believe the last day or last week of March. By November, we had the framing done on, completed pretty much on all the five buildings and then started leasing in mid-February uh, from the first building onward. So they say money loves speed doesn't mean that you're rushing to doing poor deals or you're doing a poor job. But at Boardwalk, we've innovated the construction and operation process down to a science to allow for speed. Yep. And that's thanks in um, large part to our partners, Caleb and Dustin. So thank you so much. Now, now here's some exciting news. And not to downplay our developments, which we we love, but one of our major acquisition deals just sold and excellent return numbers. Omar, I don't even know how we got these numbers. There's going to be a nice little graphic that our marketing team will insert into here. But please announce what happened and the metrics and just I'm baffled. So look, our investors already know this, but we are, I'm pleased to announce the sale of Equinox at night, 194 units in Atlanta. This outperformed um, returns. We had underwritten to 15.6% LPIRR, 1.9x equity multiple over a five-year period. We actually got 26.8% LPIRR over 2x. I think it's 2.1x equity multiple in 47 months. But the bigger point here is, again, coming back to that risk management part, right? We would already refinanced this property twice. Investors had received over 60% of their capital back. So this was a matter of knowing when to cash out your chips on an already overperforming asset. We were also able to sell this asset for $39.5 million. That equates to about um, 203600 and change per unit, which is significantly above the market for what projects are selling for right now. Just to give you an idea, 10-year newer products. So this is an 88 vintage product. A late 90s and early 2000 vintage product right now is selling in Atlanta for around $160 thousand dollars so we were able to get about forty three thousand dollars older product because of our operation proven value add business plan and a big congratulations to our investors we could not have done it without you and our partners many of them have chosen to participate in the 1031 exchange where they can shelter their massive capital gains and we will then deploy these uh monies going forward let's move on to the next section but before we do Anything you want to talk about in terms of uh, potential sales, refinances in 2024? Well, crucially, uh, when we plan this recording, I tentatively expected to say that we would likely pursue refinances this year. But then at the last moment, the Fed guided to those rate reductions we discussed right at the start. So I can say I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, you know, people who know me know I'm not like a very overly optimistic person at any moment in time, that we are looking towards doing more refinances. We will always sell if we get favorable offers. You know, every property we have has a price, can be sold at the right price. We're always open to sale. But the properties we have continue by the grace of God and good luck and our team's performance, we continue to do well operationally. We have a few rate caps. As I mentioned, we laddered out our exposure. We already have existing money, liquidity on our books to take care of that. So we will, you know, now it's all about doing what we say we're doing and what we've done in the past. But the big thing is accepting that rent growth is probably on pause for a little while. And just operating properties at max occupancy with a very positive resident community building mantra is something that I never tire of repeating. And as you can see from the charts we showed, Eric, this what we're doing is working. Now, please, people have to remember that the last 10, 12 years, it was a very easy market. People got fat and lazy. But real estate is not a get rich quick scheme. It is a get rich slowly, but stay rich scheme. But you have to be patient. That's a good point. And actually, you know, as a guy, I'm always looking for efficiencies and for patterns. And I'm, I'm seeing this pattern that we didn't plan. It's, it's efficiency, it's more consistency, and being steady Eddie. So this is a, a theme that we'll keep coming back to throughout the year and actually our whole uh, business process and our values. But on that note, Let's talk about the next section. In the third section, we'll talk about upcoming offers. So upcoming offers, uh, to frame the topic, we found that prior to the effect of the projected uh, Fed rate reductions, 
we didn't see a lot of deals pencil out of Texas, Florida, and Georgia. And we've seen that many developers in our target development state of South Dakota, they can't manage the, the capital that's required. While we're, we're moving full steam ahead and we're doing multiple new builds, we have multiple projects this year and we're de delivering them on time and within budget or even under budget in some cases. So why don't you talk about that and what we have in store? Well, yeah, it's generally true. Our outlook hasn't changed materially since our last update. And even if rates say stay lower, they would go lower, we can manage the insurance and tax situation, which I don't know how that happens, and other rising costs in Texas and Florida. That doesn't mean I'm willing to pay a seller or they think the property is worth because it has to pencil out for us. Again, we are cautiously approaching acquisitions. Look, we kept bidding on assets in 2023. We're continuing to bid on assets in 2024. Understand that acquisitions for our team it's way easier than developments. We just have to press a button. All the systems, processes, and people are in place. It's boom, 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 boom. Super duper easy. But we're not going to do transactions if they don't pencil out because we can't manage the risk there. And we aren't just going to do a transaction for the sake of doing the transactions. And we have intentionally created a platform where we have multiple avenues in which we can take advantage in various markets of dislocations that are happening. Now, I can do one of these talks every week till I'm blue in the face, and you guys will still have no idea about how much potential is still left in the Sioux Falls and South Dakota markets, what positive trends we're seeing there. Someday, Hopefully not too soon. We might lose that leverage. Other people might start coming in. More other people will coming in. But it's not anytime soon. Our target returns have always stayed the same on value-add transactions, LPIRRs over a five-year period, 13 to 17%, maybe 15%, uh, 1.7 to 1.8x equity multiple. Think of the average annual return is 13 to 70%. And on developments, LPIRR of about 16 to 20%, again, over a five-year period, equity multiple, 1.8 to 2x, pink average annual returns, 17 to 20%, give or take. Okay, let, let's dive into the numbers a little bit more so everyone is aware. Let's say in Q1, Q2, 2024, this is a two part question. So, one, how do we or how do development deals continue to pencil out in South Dakota? And two, in general, what sort of return projections are reasonable for investors to expect? From offers this year. Well, Eric, thanks for teeing me up uh, with a big fat pitch right down center blade, buddy. Yes, yeah, by design, by design. All of us, two would have known, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what are the odds? Look, let me tell you why these development deals keep penciling for us in Sioux Falls. As I mentioned, acquisitions are way easier for us to do. But these deals keep penciling for us because we have realistic ideas and we've carefully selected the markets. So, I'm going to give you some realistic return metrics that could clue in on the sponsor, whether they're being reasonable or not. Number one, like we said, Sioux Falls is one of the most stable markets in the country with a median household income much in excess of Texas, Georgia, and Florida. These are all markets, by the way, we're active in, right? Our no-fills construction model allows for a quick build and lease up. What does this mean in easy to understand English? Cash flows occur much earlier than conventional developments. And this is why banks love lending on these projects. We keep hearing banks are not lending and banks don't want to lend. Look, this is absolute BS. Banks are in the business of lending. If they don't lend, they don't make any money. And I can assure you there's no bank in the world that can thrive on not making money. They are literally in the business of making money and lending. They want to lend just with the way rates are. A lot of projects, in fact, the vast majority of projects, which are not nimble, which are not phased, they don't pencil right now. Because our projects are nimble, because we value engineering these projects to the nth degree, we're still getting 60 to 70% leverage with rates anywhere 200 to 300 basis points lower than Texas, Georgia, Florida. Now, we're able to build a better product, as a lot of our investors know, for a cheaper cost. In fact, on this upcoming development, Aspen Ridge, our hard costs of construction, including hard cost contingencies, about mid-130,000, yes, mid-130,000 a unit. We're able to cash flow quicker. And return-wise, return wise our ballpark is still the same. You know, we're targeting, development-wise, 16 to 20% LPIRR. 1.8 to 2x equity multiple, 70 to 20% average annual returns over a five-year period. Okay, well, thanks for that answer. I think that really dives into 
what we're targeting, why we're targeting, and the kind of reasoning behind it. So now we will move on to the final section. Right in the final section, we're going to go over some final thoughts. Omar, you always describe us as opportunistic investors. Opportunistic has been a bit of a change word given the uh, the economy and the kind of deals that are available. So how do you feel about, let's say, us just picking up the pieces where others have fallen short? Oh, Eric, that is very PC of you. Yes, I didn't of course. The day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you have to distinguish between other sponsors, other investors, and other residents. I don't like to be flippant about this without bragging or saying it's a zero-sum game. Oh, this person has to lose money or I could win. But at the same time, you know, we have to put our big boy and big girl pants on and realize a lot of opportunity in investment, real estate or otherwise, comes from recognizing an opportunity somebody else hasn't recognized and then capitalizing on that opportunity. And I think, no, actually, I can see from the data that in 2024, our class of residents will still be struggling to afford a decent apartment for a price they can afford. I want us to be there to provide them that residence. You can see, and I think in the audience of this video will resonate, that we're in this for the long term, and we are deeply involved in the communities that we're investing in. So if a current sponsor or a current owner doesn't have the stomach or doesn't have the capital to properly maintain and run an apartment community in the markets we're in, we're there to pick up the slack. If a city or county seeks growth and doesn't have enough multi -product, multi-family product with a lot of demand, we want to be the obvious choice to get zoned, build these products, deliver on time, and get things done. We're opportunistic in that sense. Okay, hey, I'm on board with that, and it makes sense to me. I I see this, you know, I, I see this stuff kind of behind the scenes daily, and I'm going to give a shout out to people I've already mentioned, the internal team, our partners. Let me see, I don't want to forget anyone. So we have Miles, our asset manager, Marilyn, our uh, controller, internal controller. We have Caleb Belthaus. Um, we have Dustin Hendrickson, and then all the excellent property managers from uh, Alexander Properties. And I think there's so many other people that I don't have time to mention, but I can give those people a shout out. I think, Omar, you're really focused with the numbers and you don't get a chance to elaborate on all, all these intangibles. So I'm really glad I got you down for about an hour and I forced you to answer my questions. Well, the buck has to stop somewhere, Eric. And now that you mentioned it, this reminds me, this uh, fall, a hero of mine, Sam Zell, God bless his soul, died. And as he used to say, we suffer from knowing this, from knowing the numbers. We suffer from knowing the numbers. And I can tell you this, and many other nuggets of wisdom that Sam Zell has said have guided me. So rest in peace, Sam. Hope you're doing another great deal up in heaven. What are your final thoughts, conclusions for from 2023? And 2024, moving forward. We are at the tail end of a rate tightening cycle. And while it's been painful, I would just like to say sponsors like us and other people that have survived this cycle, that have shown the value of running tight operations. And the last 10 to 12 years have made people fat and lazy. Uh, actually, can I use the word fat? Uh, can I use the word yeah. fat? Well, we might be, have to edit that out. Okay. Whatever we want. Okay. This business is hard, guys. Making money is not supposed to be easy. It is supposed to be hard. Last 10 or 12 years, that were an anomaly. That's not a reflection of reality. There is a time to be greedy and there is a time to be fearful. In the coming year, we will have many opportunities to invest. And that's a time to be greedy when everybody is down and out. They're trying to get out of the down cycle. That's where you step in. But great wealth, like great talent and great fortune, is not built by following the trend or herd. Let's continue to put our heads down. Focus on the levers we can't control. Things we can't control, don't worry about it. Continue investing in great deals conservatively every year. Consistency is the only path to long-term success in investing. So thank you so much for watching. I hope this will lead you being cautiously optimistic, just like me in 2024. Yes, everyone. Thank you for your continued trust and your continued engagement. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any questions whatsoever.